Good morning, church. It is family week, and I hope everyone is happy to be in the presence of God this beautiful Sunday morning. We are very pleased to be ministering in front of you all because you normally preach to all of us. So today, I would like to be talking about the family and God's prophecies for the family. The Bible text is taken from Psalms 128, verse 1 to 6. So can we please bow our heads for prayer? In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the miracle of sleeping and waking up. We thank you that we all came to church safely, and we thank you for joining mercies. Father, as the service goes on, Father, let the Holy Spirit come and lead us in Jesus' name. Father, we, we, we bring the service into your hands in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, I've prayed. Okay. The Bible text is taken from Psalms 128, verse 1 to 6. Psalms 128, verse 1 to 6, in the Living Bible Version. And he says, Blessings on all who reverence and trust the Lord, and on all who obey him. Their reward shall be prosperity and happiness. Your wife shall be contented in your home, and look at all those children. They sit around the dinner table as vigorous and healthy as young olive trees. That is God's reward to those who reverence and trust him. May the Lord continually bless you with heaven's blessings as well as with human joys. May you live to enjoy your grandchildren and may God bless Israel. Now, what is a family? A family is a social unit that is related by blood, marriage, or adoption. What is a prophecy? A prophecy is a prediction or foretelling of what is going to happen in the future. There are various prophecies that God has given to us all, and all we need to do to, for them to come to pass is believe in them and have faith in his holy name. Some of the prophecies are, your family is blessed. This simply, just, this simply means that your hands are blessed and whatever you do will prosper. An example of that this happened to was Abraham. Abraham um, listened to God and obeyed him and did whatever God said, told him to do. And this happened, and, and, and he got a lot of blessings from God. We shall have many blessings in Jesus' name. The second prophecy is your family is built by God. There are some families that don't have a solid foundation of God, and this is probably because they don't have their morning devotion or don't, or don't do things together as a family. This is another reason why morning devotion is very important. The third prophecy is your fruitfulness and healing are assured as a family, no matter how long conception is delayed. This simply means that no matter what trial you're going through, what, what tribulation you're going through, what problem you're going through, that God is always going to make, make a way out for you, and it's not over. The fourth prophecy is your family will not lack. This simply means that even what, what, whatever um, problem you're going through, that if you don't have funds, if, you don't, if you're not able to pay your children's school fees, if you... If you, if, you don't have any, if you don't have any money, that God is always going to make out for you that you'll never lack in Jesus' name. The fifth prophecy is your family will shine for God. So there are some families that once you see them, you see the glory of God written all over them, written all over them. This is because they do things together, they obey God, and this has come to pass in our lives in Jesus' name. So to make these prophecies come to pass in our lives, can you please repeat this prayer after me? Father, I invite you afresh to take over the affairs of my family. I recognize I can't build my family without you. Please help me in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church. So that was Theodora from class 12 of the Children Your Church. My name is Elvis Christian, and I am a representative of the Next Gen. So the Next Gen is a teen church of the city of David. So I'm basically here to share the word with you, give a ministration of God's word to his people. And may the Lord bless his word and speak through me in the mighty name of Jesus. So I'm trying to catch my breath. <laughs> okay, okay. So the, the theme for this year's Family Weekend is God's prophecies 
for the family, you know? My sister, my beautiful sister, has already successfully defined what a family is. It is a social unit established by God, relationship by blood or by adoption. A prophecy, a prophecy is a statement of prediction, of foretelling future events by divine inspiration. So God has many prophecies for his children, many of the prophecies she has already listed. But one of the things I would like to say is that he says that you'll be fruitful and you will multiply. And this isn't just biological, it means financially, politically, socioeconomically, in all ramifications, you will be fruitful and you will multiply. And your children will follow that footsteps in the mighty name of Jesus. Okay, another thing is, no evil shall come near thy dwelling place. He has said that he, you have issued a restraining order on the devil. Your business is your business, not the devil's. You will succeed in everything that you will do. You will basically dominate every sphere you find yourself in. And so with your children in Jesus' name. The Bible also said that my will is that thou mayest prosper. So prosperity is yours in Jesus' name. You know, I like the way we are all saying amen, amen to this. You understand? It doesn't just mean that, eh, as I've said it, that's how it will start happening. There are so many things that you have to do. As parents, it's not just saying amen. There are things you have to do. As parents, and we have come to the realization that most parents are found, you know, bypassing that spiritual responsibility that God has given them towards their children. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, train a child in the way that he should grow, and when he grows, he shall not depart from it. So if you give your child good foundation, he would grow well in Christ. So the Bible also said in the book of Isaiah that the children that I have given to you are for signs and wonders. So this clearly just says that. God has saddled you with the responsibilities of raising ready soldiers, ready soldiers for his army, ready soldiers that will be able to preach the word to all and sundry. You understand? So nowadays, in the 21st century, 2019, we've realized that many parents have bypassed this spiritual responsibility, and they are seen in a constant pursuit of the secular fantasies. You see them, instead of, you know, providing for, you know, the spiritual welfare of their children, they are so preoccupied with buying clothes. Taking them to the best schools. I mean, I like shoes, though. I like clothes. I like, I mean, my shoe size is 45, just in case you're wondering. You understand? I like these things. But what is most important? If you buy me shoes, it would last for, if you buy this pair of shoes, probably when I'm, next year, it might be out of fashion. I don't need it anymore. Do you understand? I want a new one. And you have to buy another one. But spiritual, spiritual matters are something that would last a lifetime. You understand? If you constantly pray with your family members, with your children, if you teach your children that prayer is not an activity, it is communication with God. Sharing the word of God is not studying for an exam. It's feeding your spirit man with God's word. Your children would not go for exhibiting something they shouldn't be. You can't tell me you, would, you have successfully imbibed good moral standards on your children and you grow up and your children are bad people generally. It's not. You understand? And God knows that you have done, the, you have done what you are supposed to do. So He would help you. He will aid you and perfect His words in your children. Thank you, thank you. So, I'm just going to speak about parental responsibility from the perspective of a teenager. You know, many a times our parents neglect us, and we know. And we know we see these things. Many a times you want to be in our lives not because you love us, or so to say, because you want to be. You are in our lives you interfere or show your affection because we're obligated to. You know, there's a difference. Doing something because it's a job and doing something because you love it. Two different things. We want you to, because it's not enough to tell me I love you, I care for you, I want the best for your life. Show me. How do you show me? By giving me Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There is nothing better than it. There's no shoe, no school, no expensive fabric. Nothing is better than that. Nowadays, suicide is the order of the day. Depression is everywhere. Many teenagers are sliding into depression. It, is, it, is, it was before that, old, that it's an adult problem. It's no more an adult problem. Everybody has this issue. And why do people feel depressed? They feel alone. They, they're very lonely. Why are they lonely? The thing is that they don't have that Jesus Christ that feels in where you cannot do anything. You know, there's a popular saying, heaven help those who help themselves. I don't know if this makes sense, but I believe heaven helps you when you can't even help yourself. You understand? Where your hands can't reach, heaven helps you there. You take your, and many of us have children in sexual institutions. You don't stay with them every day, do you? You don't. That is where heaven comes in. 
That is where the foundation that you have laid for your children comes in. A topic on, a top, the topic about parental responsibility is a very, very sentimental topic, a very fragile topic that both science and religion are in a common stand. Like, like there is a, there's, a, there's an agreement between science and religion here. So psychologists, psychologists in the house will, will, know, will know this developmental psychologist known as P. Jean Piaget. He said that the ages of one to seven are the most formative years of a child. So that is when socialization is, more, is most potent, most important. That is when, what is socialization? Socialization can be defined as the process of imbibing new moral standards and new, you know, belief systems and norms, rules and regulations to a new generation. In simpler terms, socialization is your mother and father teaching the child. That's what God says as well. You understand? So that's an agreement between science and religion. So, do you think your child from age one to seven will learn from you by reading a book about you? No, they would not. How do they learn? They learn by imitating you. That in a constant pursuit of things that you do, the first role models a child ha a ch ch um, first role model a child has is the parent before external forces. You understand? So, our tent is there, like outside there. So there's so many things that we see that most of you don't see. See, we come to church in the morning and obviously the parking space inside because the city of David is blessed. So there are lots of cars everywhere. So the cars are packed and the church is full on time. And a person, is, a, a, a man with a very fancy car with kids in the car drives into church and the security guard is like, excuse me, ma, the parking lot, or excuse me, excuse me, sir, the parking lot is full. There are other spaces. Then you hear things like, do you know who I am? Why would you talk to me like that? Some of them even wind down when the person is talking. I believe that irres irrespective of social class, human beings should be treated equally and respectfully. <laughs> you understand? And one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing is, what you don't realize is that your children are in the car with you. Like I said before, they are your role, they are, you are their role models, so they are learning from you. These people see that you're being rude and they're like, my dad is rude and nobody slapped him. I mean, it's okay. Do you understand? My daddy was rude to that man, and no one, no one, he didn't have immediate consequences. No, consequences will come eventually. But children want to see, did they beat him now, now, now? They did not. So you will end up successfully raising an entitled child. He will go on to society believing that everything he deserves. He has the right to everything. He has the right to be rude to whoever he wants to be. And that's not true, that's not fair, that's not, that's not right. You understand? That is not what we should be inculcating to our children. Good moral standing, good Christian religious practices is what is to be stressed in families. You understand? So, by implication, it means that if a child grows up in the house where the mother beats up the, the wife, that's, if, if, if it's a boy, if it's a son, he, the chances that he would grow up to be a woman beater, would, it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very high. It's very high. So don't think we, are, we, we don't see, we, we watch you. So if your daughter grows up in the house where her mother is constantly beaten up, she will grow up with, that, with the ideology that it is okay to be, to be seen as, as an object of domestic violence. Is that right? Do you want that for your children? I'm sure you don't want, because I know no sane parents wants to, wants to do anything that will be at the detriment of their child. We know you, we, we, we see that you know, you're trying your best, but there is a lot more to be done. I school in the University of Lagos. Uh, um, I study political science. I want to be a politician. <laughs> so um, we do some courses in uh, philosophy where we legit have to criticize God's existence. There are some courses in schools where you, you have to write episodes how God doesn't exist. The lecturer tells you if you can't feel God physically, if you can't touch him like this, if you can't hear him, and others are hearing me as well, you're hearing me. If you can't hear him, if you can't feel his touch, if, you don't, if he's not matter, he doesn't exist. And strategically, the devil is very smart, and people most times parents underestimate his, his intelligence. He, they strategically put professors and lecturers that are atheists to teach these courses. And these lecturers are any small, ex, any small excuse, probably a pin just held. He will use that thing as an example to criticize God's existence, to criticize Christianity in its entirety. So imagine a child that does not have the foundation from home, because it's a tertiary institution. So for you to have gotten there, you should have had foundation from your parents. So imagine a child that doesn't know that God is the king of kings, the I am that I am, the one who is, who was, who is to come, who is the author and the finisher of his feet. Imagine a child that doesn't know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. 
Imagine a child that hasn't been soaked deep in the word of God. Imagine a child at that age can't speak in tongues. Just imagine. Because I stay in class and I see people that I am very, very sure. These people are friends. I see them, acquaintances. These people are from Christian homes. And when it's time for an interactive session, they raise their hands up and they join in the criticism. Most of your kids do it. I mean, it happens every time. I have to pass the exam. I mean, I have to have a good grade. So I'll write the exam and I'll pass. But I know the truth. Because I have what? The foundation. You understand? I am very certain where I stand in society. I am very certain that God loves me. I love him. His thought of me are of good and not of evil to lead me to an expected end. You understand? So that foundation is very, very, very much important. I feel you should even focus more on providing for the spiritual welfare of your kids as opposed to providing material possessions. You understand? Another thing is, another thing is, uh, in universities as well, we have, you know, there was a documentary that was released um, sometime, some weeks ago, about sexual harassment in schools. You know, there are reports that some children, you know, feel so comfortable with their parents such that when things like that happen, they call the parents and tell the parents, this is what is happening. But it means that there are also other teenagers, other children that are not comfortable with telling their parents these things. Do you know why? Because the parents don't trust them. The parents do not believe them. Imagine a child picks up the call and picks up the phone and tells mom, the mom that I was trying to make some probably arrangements with my results and my lecturer sexually harassed me. There are cases where the parents will tell, what were you doing there? What is wrong with you? The people that were in the classroom, do they have two heads? I mean, you're not wrong to reprimand your child, but is that what the child needs then? No, that's not what I want to hear. I want to hear it's okay, come home, let's settle this, this issue amicably. At that point in time, repri reprimanding me will come later. My dad always used this, my dad is a very, very good slapper. <laughs> like, he doesn't need a belt. I mean, many times I hear my friends are like, oh, my dad to just remove the belt. I was like, my dad doesn't have that power. There's no time. It's like re default setting, factual default setting. One, he just woes you once. And everything is settled. You understand? It is okay for him, that is his style of discipline. But many a times there is a statement that says different folks strokes for different folks. You know, there are some children that listen more to physical, I don't know, I don't know physical discipline if that's, a, if that's a thing. But there are some people like me, I don't like King. Talk to me and I will listen. Talk to your children. Share time, spend time together. I know you want to provide, I know you have work, you have everything that is, oh, we know. We know you want to get the best schools for us, we know. But spend time with us, that little 10 minutes, one hour, and spending time with us is not sitting down and watching the same television show we are watching. <laughs> That's not spending time with me. Spending time with me is coming, my name is Elvis, my dad calls me Chudubim. Chudubim, come here, what is going on? Tell me, but sometimes, our African parents, it's not always so. It's not very easy to open up because once you open up the tool, they will use it against you, eventually. <laughs> eventually, eventually. But that's by the way, that's by the way. That's by the way, there's a lot parents must do, you know, to attain that their children have an amazing life experience. And that life experience will be nothing without Jesus Christ. That is the most important thing. That life experience will be nothing without you. In universes, we have Ron's girls. Ron's girls are classy prostitutes. Young girls, really, you see them in school, you drive into, let me just give you, just drive into any university of your choice at about 7.30 p.m. You see girls in wearing literally almost nothing, walking around, and you see, they walk to a car, and you see the person picking them up, an older person. It's like, I know you all know the sugar daddy, sugar mommy thingy, and I mean, everybody knows that. It's sad, your children are, this is happening, this is real. So if you don't tell your child that the body is the temple of Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit and should not be joked with, that child would not, you know, be found doing things like that. And I know because I said runs girls, most of the parents will run home now, okay, my daughter, let me can start training her now. <laughs> I've seen, runs girls are not are in existence because there are demand for it. And who demands it? The males. So train both your boys and your girls. No preferential treatment. Treat them as equals, train them, the same thing you give to the son, give to your daughter. You understand what I mean? Because bad vices do not look at gender. They hit you and hit you, hit you out of the park, period. You get. 
Many attempts, another thing that parents do that actually are a detriment to our entire life experience is that they, you pressure yourself so much. There's a lot of things on your mind. Calm down. You understand? Easy, 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 easy. You get. You see parents because they're in a, in a certain network where Mr. A probably has a net worth of 10 billion naira, Mr. B has a net worth of 100 million dollars, and so to say. And you're okay, you're wealthy, but you are not as wealthy as your friends. So because your friends have your, 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 your children schooling in Canada, the other is in Australia, the one is, is in London, but you, you know in the deep of your heart, you cannot afford London. You know. But you will still go and take these children and expose them to several, several vices abroad just because you want to, you know, be among your network. I mean, if you train your children, your children would know that they are to be content with that that you give them. So if you tell your son, I mean, I didn't even have a debate. They told me, this is where you are schooling. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Period. You understand? Train your children to be content, and everything that you give them, which is good and which is of the Lord, will be accepted by them. Amen. Amen. So, 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 I would just want to give a, a very short advice to our parents. I know many people here will be like, what does he know he's 19? I mean, I was 19 before. That's one thing my mommy always says. So. she comes come and like, uh-uh, there's nothing you'll do I've not done. You're 19, I was 19 before. And I'm like... It's 2019, things have changed. <laughs> things have changed. You understand? A lot of things have changed. The struggles a 19 year old had in 1970 is not the same struggle I have now. It's not. In the, probably in the 80s, and probably they have issues like uh, um, probably academic problems and all. We have depression now, we have suicide now. It is very steep. You don't even have to go to www.iwanttowatchpornography.com to watch porn nowadays. It pops up on your screens. See, just see what your children are going through. So, just imagine a child that has a foundation. Once it pops up, he cancels it spiritually and physically. With his hand, he cancels it. Because he can cancel search results. And one thing that parents feel, you people feel you know too much. You don't know about it. You don't know. You don't know. They always claim, I know this, I've been 19 before, I've done this before. You've not. Because, like, because you think you're on WhatsApp now, you're on Instagram, you're hip, and you're woke, and oh, you're not. You don't know. Because on WhatsApp now, um, there's this new feature. I can text with you. We can text, but you won't see what I post. I can stop you from seeing my status updates. You understand? I mean, you know this one now. We even have abbreviations that only we understand. I have a friend that her mom reads her text. She tells me, oh, Elvis, sometimes when I text, my mom actually reads this text, so she takes my phone later. I'm like, okay. No, that's like, okay, that's, that's what your, parent, your mom wants. Then whenever we want to communicate, <laughs> whenever we want to communicate, and eventually you don't want the mom to see it, ah, we send a voice note. The moment she can verify that I have listened, it's deleted, and there is no evidence that she sent anything. So you even checking, you, you even going so much as invading privacy, it does not work again. It doesn't. So what is the best you can do? The best you can do is provide that Christian foundation. It is so sad that we have, the, there's a little, there's so much little our next gen teenagers, our teachers can do. They control just, let's say four hours on a Sunday. You take 24 hours, six days of the week. So there's very little they can do. Summer camp every year, we have the summer camp, and at this summer camp, we experience the Holy Spirit fresh. Like, he comes and he visits us like, gang gang, let's me are you today. You understand? I experienced, my experience this year was so amazing. I experienced live miracles. I saw miracles happen there. I had a friend that her hand was hurting, and she, we knew about it, and she had her healing there. But you know the sad thing? Prior to going to summer camp, there were many teenagers that were saying, my parents won't let me go. Why? Why not? I mean, the food is amazing. I mean, look at me, I'm healthy enough. My skin is glowing. You know, so not, if the food is good, everything is, why, why, why should you directly inhibit your children from attaining a certain spiritual height? Children are, teenagers are blessed with the gift of speaking in tongues. 
are blessed with several gifts that they had no idea they could do. Talent horn. So we had a party, a Holy Ghost party, the right kind of party with the right kind of music, the right environment, the right people you're partying with. It's better than taking your child on, a, on his 18th birthday to a bar mitzvah, a bar, and tell him to drink. I have a friend that on his 18th birthday, his dad gifted him a condom. That is encouraging for me. What kind? What? Haba. Do you understand? There's a lot we parents must do. And just to conclude, uh, one of the problems of Nigeria, aside corruption and, you know, and probably embezzlement of public funds is underutilization of resources. You know, I studied political science, so. <laughs> Anyways, underutilization of resources. God is our father, and this guy is a fresh guy. The guy, he's, very, he's always there for you. He would give you a trial, give you tribulations, give you problems, and still stand there and tell you, just in case you need help, this is what you do. Call the Holy Spirit. But we, most parents don't do that. Not only do they not do it, they do not advise their children to connect to the Holy Spirit. Your child is not too young to speak in tongues. Your child is not too young to raise the dead. Your child is not too young to take megaphones and start preaching around this place. Your child is not too young to be a pastor. He's not too young to be an evangelist. Do you understand? So encourage Christian moral principles. We had a parent forum in our church. And the next gen, combination, a combination of the junior church and the next gen, we have over 1,000 children, teenagers combined. But do you know one shocking thing? We found out that only 10 parents attended. So what happened to 990 parents of the families represented? What happened? It's a Sunday. You can't tell me you had work. If you had work, why are you working in Sabadi? You understand? There's a lot to do. There's a very little the next gen teachers can do. The, the, the Genesis fashion show, we preach beauty in decency. You don't have to expose your body to, you know, be beautiful. That's what I'm wearing. Very fine shirt I'm wearing now. Dominate the Genesis. Let me, let me show you. See. You understand? There's very little the next gen teachers can do. Because imagine we are always saying dress decently and the mother of the, of the daughter of the child or the father of the child has his trousers sagging here. What can our pastors do? There is nothing. Because you are the real influences on your child's life. Do you understand? So we, your, ch your children, have decided to dominate. It's written on my shirt right now. Uh, we've decided to dominate every sphere of our lives. We want you to help us have a good life experience. How do you help us have a good life experience? You help us have a good life experience by giving us Jesus Christ. He's the author, the finisher of our faith. Is the only good thing that this world has ever produced. You understand? Teach us to fellowship. Teach us to have good moral Christian values. And the love of God will be with you. And prosperity will be yours. And most importantly, most importantly, you will fulfill God's prophecies in your families. Thank you so much. Let's clap for Jesus.